Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you to, uh, particular thanks to Polly for inviting me to open the series. Um, as Polly mentioned, uh, today I'm presenting a paper entitled What the Grecians Earn, uh, Irreverence in Palim Palimpsestic Reception. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, some irreverent encounters with the classical tradition, primarily through the medium of music videos. So specifically, uh, the music videos for Lil Nas X's 2021 single Montero, Call Me By Your Name, uh, and Lizzo featuring Cardi B's single Rumours, also from 2021. Both works extensively refer to the classical um, and both have received extensive scholarly attention as popular classical receptions. But as I discussed throughout this paper, neither work necessarily engages directly with antiquity, and both of them utilise uh, long chains of intermediaries in order to access classical themes. So today uh, I want to speak less about ancient sources, which for these receptions are myriad and include uh, various deliberate misreadings uh, and innovations to suit the, the versions of the stories that they're telling to their specific audiences, and more about the receptions themselves, including exactly what they are receiving, if not ancient texts, and why humour is an implicit part of how they're projected. As I argue, uh, the resultant palimpsestic products showcase a playful irreverence for antiquity and for the classical canon, which is utilised as a strategy for destabilising such concepts as what is classic, what is tradition or traditional, uh, and the canon itself. I split my talk today then into three parts. So first, I'll discuss the texts themselves and their place in their res respective reception histories. Um, second, I'll turn towards some frameworks for thinking about such receptive histories and whether even receptive history is the right way to think about them. Um, and finally, I'll be returning briefly to the text themselves with some conclusions around what irreverence produces for reception. So I want to open with the first part then on tracing the text. Uh, perhaps a little counterintuitively, um, so I was, I'm going to start by sort of tracing the allusions to antiquity uh, in Montero and Rumours. And my aim here isn't to engage in old fashioned receptive survey of where we can see the classics in the text um, or whether it's been interpreted rightly or wrongly. Instead, I want to illustrate that the often interrupted sequences of allusion that have led to these productions before later talking more in depth about their how their appeals to humour function. So first I'll chart these elements in Lizzo's rumours. Upon its release, the video was widely lauded as something of an audition by Lizzo for a role as one of the muses in the upcoming live action remake of Disney's 1997 animated classic Hercules. As should be apparent from this alone, the video is deeply implicated within a series of past and future receptions. And indeed, the visual language of the video is deeply indebted to the earlier film. Recognisable elements connecting the two include the opening scene of Lizzo being depicted on a vase, um, an image which is repeated through animated figures who appear on pottery throughout the video, um, an animated fresco of gossips, which we can see on the slide. Uh, Lizzo and her dancers performing atop columns, which was my opening slide. Um, Lizzo strutting down a staircase flanked by vases featuring animated vignettes. Again, there's an image of this on the slide. Um, Lizzo is costumed as a vase at some point. Um, Cardi B appears costumed like a caryatid with uh, an ionic column headdress. Um, and there's similar um, visual references throughout the video that link it to uh, its predecessor, Hercules. So the video also includes uh, some visual references to more general images from Greco-Roman antiquity. Um, phalluses in particular feature heavily forming Cardi B's throne, which you should be able to see on the slide there. Um, oh, sorry, and Amy. I'm so Hello? sorry. Oh, these slides haven't moved on. Um, uh, can can you uh what can you see now we can see it they haven't gone um slideshow hasn't started i can just see the i can still see like the ribbon and stuff right uh 
can you see the rumor screen now i can but it's not um the, it's not presenting if you see what i mean hmm. Can you see um, the scenes from rumours on this one? Not so it's not the opening. Yeah, if yeah, it's yeah. So on. Let's do it like this then. Yeah, let's do it like this. Yeah. Right. So hopefully you can see uh, the images that I've um, that I've just described. So um, as I said, Lizzo uh, flanked by her dancers was the opening slide. Um, but here you should be able to see the animated fresco of the gusset. Um, Lizzo uh, descending the staircase, which is very reminiscent of a, a very similar scene uh, at the beginning of Hercules. Um, and then some kind of less uh, less related elements. Um, but yes, so to return to where I was, yeah, the, the video um, includes some more general visual references. So um, here you can see Cardi B's uh, phallus throne um, and not pictured uh, it is She's also surrounded by winged phalli, um, which are a more general link with imagery from Greco-Roman antiquity. Uh, the animated scenes, um, you can again see one here on the slide, um, include a pole dancer, which provides a visual connection with Lil Nas X's Montero video, um, as well as his own reference for, that, for the scene in his video from FKA Twiggs' video for cellophane. Um, there's a woman um, in rope bondage, there's a twerking dancer, and there's a fizzing bottle of Papi Champagne, which demonstrates the same, each of these images demonstrate the same playing with contemporary images through the medium of the Greek vase as is seen in Disney's Hercules. Um, here in this video, they depict visual Easter eggs that connect the songs, uh, connect to the song's lyrics. So for example, uh, the champagne references Champagne Papi, which is um, another name for Drake, who's implicated himself in one of the song's rumours through the lyrics. And in this way, rumours yokes itself closely to Disney's film. While the narrative uh, is minimal in the video, its commitment to its premise of celebrating in divine terms, the feminine, black, fat and queer is very clear. Hercules, the Disney film, is of course itself deeply irreverent and funny. A fairly early exercise for Disney in adapting mythology to be widely acceptable for, and more importantly, commercially attractive to children, Hercules illustrates the need for humor in such adaptation and continues a trend already apparent to Disney as early as 1940s Fantasia. Hercules itself owes much to Fantasia's depiction of classically inspired creatures, the representation of Phil, Hercules' satyr mentor, arguably shares DNA with Fantasia's childish fawns, a tenant of Bacchus, as does Bacchus himself. Unlike rumours, Fantasia, and less obviously Hercules, reassert the dominance of the tradition and the classical through variant strategies. It should be noted here that both Hercules and Fantasia are part of Disney's classics collection and themselves form canonical texts, if not for scholars of classical reception, than at least for audiences of both Disney and classical mythology and reception alike. Despite its excitement and playfulness, Fantasia is quite literally underpinned by the concept of the classical, with the, mytholo with the myth mythology sequence animating Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony. The silly and drunken Bacchus and his celebrants are put in their place by Zeus, who reasserts order by throwing thunderbolts at everybody with the aid of Hephaestus. Although the playful nature of the scene is reasserted at the end, it is largely confined to the behaviour of children, baby winged horses, the childish fawns and the baby like cupids who frolic in the puddles and enjoy the rainbow drawn by Iris. And as the movement ends with nightfall, they are tucked into bed by their adult counterparts, muddling the expectation for children of the period. Hercules similarly rejects irreverence in its conclusion, in which Hercules himself, having finally become a true hero, declines his place on Olympus to live and love as a mortal man. Notably, this is also the conclusion of the 2010 remake of Clash of the Titans, again demonstrating the wide network of associations created by receptions, especially those as influential as Hercules. 
as an adaptation that serves commercial interests far more than one which seeks to disseminate Greco-Roman mythology through a new audience. Hercules, from where my title is drawn, broadly innovates upon, broadly innovates, uh, upon its ancient source material. Although it does exhibit some novel and interesting ways of telling the story to children, that includes some of the more difficult parts of the Hercules, Pericles myth. In most of these cases, humour is utilised to further develop them into parts of the tale that are appropriate for children. Among them include Hercules' love interest Meg, whose character and, and her associated plotline take in both the ancient Heracles' first wife, Megara, whom he murders along with their children, and his last mortal wife, Dionyra, who, he, who ends up killing him with a poison cloak. Both figures are folded into the sarcastic Meg, whose encounter with the centaur Nessus who in ancient versions gives Dionyra with a poison that later kills Hercules, promising it is a love potion that will instead keep him faithful, comes very close to the sexual assault of ancient myth, but is instead injected with humour, punctuated by Meg's cool cynicism, and underlined by Hercules' first and barely successful fight. Hercules' labours are also accommodated by the comedic approach, including his fight against the Hydra. An element that I find particularly of note is the film's approach to the aforementioned Phil, a version of Philip Titi's, best known from a Euripides play of the same name, in which the eponymous hero is abandoned on Lemnos on the way to Troy, having been bitten by a snake, Phil is not especially representative of his namesake. However, the ancient Philip Titi's is associated with Heracles. He, or his father, is the only person who will light the pyre for the dying Heracles, receiving his bow and arrows in return. In Hercules, Phil's role is more like that of the centaur Chiron, but his isolation and disappointment in his failure to produce a hero do echo the dramatic Philoctetes abandonment by the Greek army. Phil's association with the abandoned Philoctetes also makes sense of his instant and strong dislike of Meg. Philoctetes likes Heracles' pyre when he's dying because of the actions of Dionyra. Again, the film's classical illusion is made legible and appropriate for children via an air of levity. I mention these associations not because they have any specific bearing on Lizzo's video, but precisely because they do not. Lizzo and Cardi B develop instead a thread of the film that is not drawn specifically from the Heracles myth, an image, uh, an image of the muses. Heracles' muses are consciously associated with gospel music, chosen by co-writer and co-director John Musker for its relationship to storytelling. Her uh, Hercules' muses, of which there are five, rather than nine, are very carefully chosen. Self-proclaimed goddesses of the arts, they loosely engender their named ancient counterparts. Of most significance here, particularly for Lizzo, is Thalia, muse of comedy and idyllic or pastoral poetry. There isn't much poetry for Hercules' Thalia, but her plump appearance provides a rather unfortunate visual shorthand for her role as comedy relief and she frequently delivers bawdy lines that disrupt the seriousness of any particular scene. Although disconnected in that there is no indication of a deliberate invocation of receptive history, it is also worth remembering here that the Fantasia sequence animates a pastoral symphony, a job well within Thalia's remit, underlined by the boozy Bacchus and his revelers. It is this that Lizzo and Cardi B developed. Lizzo's body positive vision of the feminine divine, distilled through Thalia, disrupts the male gaze engendered by the beauty and allure of Hercules' muses. While the irreverent, bawdy, and sexually explicit imagery of the video engages deeply with Thalia's mythological function as muse of comedy. I return to this towards the end of the talk, but for now, let's examine the reception history of Lil Nas X's Montero. Uh, before I even start with the imagery of this video, uh, I should note that the idea of classics broadly defined is baked into the very name of the song itself. Call Me By Your Name is the name of a 2017 film uh, based on a 2007 novel of the same name in which a young man, the son of an archaeology professor, has a short relationship with his father's assistant, a doctoral student. I lack the space here to explore the entire video in depth. And in any case, the first sequence has been well explored by scholars, uh, including Vanessa Stovall. Um, but I will, however, briefly note that there is a 
definite visual similarity between the opening scene of the video, uh, which depicts a landscape littered with classical architecture, and a scene in Fantasia, which pans across a comparable, if much more orderly landscape. Um, on the Society for Classical Studies blog, Stowall has skillfully compared the inclusion of a quote from Plato's Symposium to Aristophanes' story on the origin of love, um, from Aristophanes' story on the origin of love to a version of the same story in John Mitchell Cameron's musical Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Instead, I want to focus here what we might term Act Two of the Montero video, a scene in which Naz is led into a coliseum and chained before being stoned to death. The rapper is escorted into an arena, uh, wearing a pink furry garment reminiscent of a ram wrapped around his torso and across one shoulder, which you should be able to see here on the slide. Um, the ram is a possible visual reference to the mythical golden fleece, and he wears a loincloth. He has short pink curly hair, wears a choker necklace and gladiator style sandals. Once escorted into the arena, he's thrown to the ground and he's next depicted standing and chained to the spot by his wrists. The scene has two primary visual predecessors, neither of them ancient, but both receptive. The first and perhaps most recognizable to reception scholars who study film is from the 1958 Italian peplum film, Hercules. Lil Nas X appears almost identically to Steve Reeves' Hercules. Like the rapper, Reeves', Reeves character is chained, to the wrist, chained by the wrist to two pillars. Naz's costume is closely styled on Reeves' one shoulder tunic, although it manages to load, references, uh, load up references to the mythical Golden Fleece with its ram's head detail, and to Heracles' famous lion skin through its furry texture and the allusion to the cinematic Hercules. This itself engages closely with the earlier film, like Disney's own take on the Hercules myth the 1958 Hercules innovates upon the myth, this time for an audience seeking action, adventure, and romance. Much like Disney's version, Hercules' plot, which we might expect from its Italian title, Le Fetiche de Hercule, to be inspired by Hercules' labors, actually draws from Ap Apollonius of Rhodes' Argonautica. This is in fact noted, along with its free style of adaptation in the film's opening credits. Hercules somewhat swaps roles with Jason, the actual hero of the text. Hercules must thus see, seek the Golden Fleece while pursuing a romantic relationship with the Princess Iole, another woman who in ancient, who in ancient mythology is implicated in Heracles' death. Already then, we can see Leon X's engagement with the receptive text of the 1958 Hercules at the cost of a close engagement with sources drawn directly from antiquity. The second predecessor is much less expected, that of SpongeBob SquarePants. Referencing his storyboarding process on Twitter, Lil Nas X has alluded to the SpongeBob episode, The Smoking Peanut, as a visual reference for the scene in the video. In the SpongeBob episode, Patrick Starfish is chained in an arena by the arms in exactly the same manner as Reeves and Hercules. Despite SpongeBob itself being in a repository for classical illusion, this episode features no other references to classical themes, instead satirizing real life attacks by captive orchids against their keepers, namely SeaWorld Shamu. In SpongeBob, Clamu is upset by SpongeBob throwing a peanut. Whether or not SpongeBob featured in Naz's part of the actual process, as it is clear that the film Hercules does have some direct influence on the artistic direction of the music video, the SpongeBob scene is, is itself directly and pointedly inspired by the specific scene of Hercules breaking his chains in Hercules, uh, the 1958 Hercules. In any case, the privileging of SpongeBob's visuals by Lil Nas X in terms of framing the scene prioritizes irreverence and the lack of direct engagement with antiquity works to destabilize the very notion of the canon and the importance of the classical tradition. It should be clear at this point that in terms of ancient source material, Hercules himself is a binding factor of these two receptions. The hero does receive comic treatment in ancient drama, for example, in Aristophanes' Frogs. Despite this, the majority of his dramatic treatment does not offer a comedic element, and aspects of his story which might otherwise, if problematically, be considered humorous today were not generally so in the ancient world. For example, Hercules' time spent cross-dressing as Amphali. However, it should also be clear at this point, uh, 
as should also be clear at this point, uh, this dramatic and mythographic Hercules is not the same Hercules summoned by either Lizzo or by Lil Nas X. Lizzo's use of Hercules sidesteps the hero entirely, while Lil Nas X draws from a divergent tradition whose root is in mid-century cinema, itself consciously cleaved from ancient mythology. So now at this point, I would like to turn towards some frameworks. I've done quite a simplistic and superficial job here of tracing some of the classical elements through Rumours and Montero, but I want to think more deeply here about how these work. You may have noticed that I've made very little reference throughout those histories uh, to ancient sources or to indeed any sources pre 20th century. Although it would most certainly be possible to trace the references from the intermediary texts of the respective Hercules films, back through a visual and or performance tradition, the point I want to make is of the inherent disconnect between the music video texts I highlight here and not only ancient texts, but also receptive ones that more closely engage with ancient mythology and or the ancient past. So how can we conceptualize this? Can we even call these texts classical reception? I think it should be obvious that I am wholeheartedly in favour of considering these uh, considering these music videos to be receptive texts, but this position deserves exploration and requires further justification. A pertinent and provocative question around this is asked by Claire Foster in her chapter on vocabulary for classical reception studies. Foster asks, and I quote, what qualifies as an instance of primary classical reception rather than an instance of other more important agendas such as commercial viability, fashion, education, or the use values of tradition itself. Agendas which can be entirely deracinated from any interest in a historical ancient Greece or Rome." End quote. Buster explores this question through the suggested vocabulary of recognition capital and imaginaries of sequence. As an example, Foster explores the case from 2004 of US Marines performing a chariot race before an attack in Iraq. Noting the invocation by the soldiers of 1959's Ben-Hur, Foster considers the source material, which she reconfigures as a resource for collective recognition and engagement for the soldiers' engagement with antiquity, which, as she further notes, is more accurately an engagement with an imaginary sequence developed from the 1880 publication of the novel Ben-Hur. Ultimately, she concludes here, what links the various iterations of Ben-Hur that are listed is, quote, not the persistence of meaning, but the persistence of recognition capital, end quote. What does this mean then for the present examples? I have already demonstrated that much like the Marines, Neither Lizzo nor Lil Nas X are referring to ancient sources, but to resources of imaginaries of sequence emanating from specific traditions. Arguably, these traditions, which are bound irre irrevocably together for the two by popular depictions of Hercules, ha both have their root in Steve Reeves's turn as the eponymous hero of the 1958 peplum, Hercules. It is no coincidence that this film is the opening film of the peplum genre and can therefore be pointed to, if artificially, as a beginning of an imaginary of sequence, which might, mirroring Foster's Ben-Hur example, be as tight as the peplum films about Hercules, or might, as I suggest, be as broad as audiovisual engagement with Hercules as a gendered figure whose masculinity is expressed supported and or shaped by the contemporary landscape. Both Lizzo and Lil Nas X are artists whose vehicles, uh, whose videos are vehicles which help to sell their songs to their audiences. Rumours is particularly reliant on its video as a standalone single that is not included in an album collection. Their agendas are thus, to use Foster's terms, commercial viability and, as I contend, the use value of tradition. However, I think that both engagements run deeper than this rather cynical view, even deeper than the modern experiences suggested by the recognition capital that the references stir up for both artists and audience. I turn to some different frameworks then to consider these deeper questions. To be clear at this point, I probably am going to generate more questions than answers here. 
Um, this issue forms a key part of the framework of my PhD thesis. Um, and so I can only present my thoughts so far here. So apologies if, if it's a little bit sketchy. Um, so moving forward with Montero and rumours then, how can we explore their engagement with classical themes in the knowledge that they do not, in fact, seek to engage with antiquity itself? Here are some, here are some frameworks of theoretical connectivity can, can start to guide us. Uh, Deleuze and Guattari's concepts of the rhizome and arborescence are pertinent here, although neither quite fit um, rhizomatic thinking, which Deleuze and Guattari conceptualize in opposition to trees as grass with its concept in the non-hierarchical, non-linear and resistance to chronology is a very tempting framework. But its inherent invocation of constant connection undermines the point that I identify about the disconnection between the ancient and the modern in terms of sources and material. Moving away from the rhizomatic, theorizing around mycorrhizal networks by Madhuri Ramachandran and later Vanessa Stovall has the potential to describe much more succinctly the symbiotic nature of perception, along with the duality of both visible and invisible networks that form connections between ideas. However, I once again find this too invested in the significance of constant connection for my uses here. Uh, within my PhD thesis, I currently use the language of moments and resonances to describe the breakaway influential receptions and their responses that begin and continue what Foster describes as imaginaries of sequence. I find that this sums up the potential connections between texts, where the resonances may overlap like ripples emanating from a drop in a pool, while not inherently implicating connection as a feature. A key aspect of theorising this area has also been the problem of chronology, which is dealt with by several theorists. Um, the moment similarly abandons chronology and a resonance, particularly when thinking thematically, may be a reception either forwards or backwards in time from the point of, point of production of a particularly influential reception. This effectively disrupts the directional nature implied by the imaginary of sequence while preserving its underlying concept of a set of interrelated texts. As an example, I would place Disney's Hercules as the moment from which the 1958 Hercules resonates, because while they can both be thematically linked, the prioritising of the earlier film reflects neither its influence now or around the time of its production. In fact, its 1959 sequel, Hercules Unchained, performed better. So in light of this, then, let me make a brief adaptation to the rhizomatic model that might here help us frame these irreverent receptions in light specifically of their lack of direct engagement with antiquity. Rhizomatic plants have uh, two important features that make the rhizome or have the potential to make the rhizome a pertinent framework for me. First, the ability to store energy as tubers. The receptions that grow so huge that they eclipse in popular thought their ancient counterparts, what I currently call moments, are like new tubers storing the next node of reception history. Because they remain rhizomatic, they are not chrono chronologically prioritised, but they cement their place as influential texts. This is the case for Disney's Hercules. Second, the ability to grow independently of their parent and form new rhizomatic networks that look the same, look like the same plant, but are entirely disconnected. The second feature is key. Anyone who's ever battled bindweed or nutweed will know that it takes only a minuscule part of the rhizome severed from the plant to start the process all over again. To return again then to Disney's Hercules, Disney's film began life as a text broadly influenced by its sources but its offshoots, especially those that are not concerned with revisiting antiquity, become something new altogether, like Foster's resource, albeit something that shares the majority of its DNA with ancient sources. In simple terms then, an idea remains connected, but not necessarily informed by its parent, because rhizomatic plants are often extremely hardy due to the nature of the rhizome, which can survive from small pieces detached entirely from its root system. And they also need not be drawn from the parent because rhizomes are non-hierarchical, 
this process can go on ad infinitum. To turn back to rumours and Monterra then, this adaptive model of the rhizome can help us to understand them as receptions that emanate from a shared resource, but that do not look the same or even share the same thematic focus. It is a disconnect allowed for by this model that explains their differences in the face of their commonalities. So I hope that you're all still uh, with me here. <laughs> uh, I return now to the videos themselves for the final part of this talk uh, to consider the specific function that irreverence plays in them as classical receptions. So I chose the idea of irreverence to describe these texts rather than the language of comedy more broadly as per the theme of this seminar uh, series um, or the more negative sounding mockery, ridicule or derision because irreverence with its connotations of flippancy and cheekiness does due to the reasons for injecting these particular kinds of humour. Irreverence, is, not, irreverence uh, is about not giving serious things their expected respect, and that is exactly what's going on in these videos. However, I would argue that they are not making mock of either their source texts, which are not, as I've demonstrated, derived from antiquity, but simply reasserting otherwise marginal communities and identities as themselves worthy of respect and admiration by destabilizing canonical imaginaries of sequence. Having established a framework then, I want to now discuss some of the implications for the kind of media and how this makes a reference a key strategy. So as music videos, both texts deserve exploration along some specific lines. I call attention here to an assertion by Fran Middleton on the materiality of reception. And I quote, reception is an act not only contextualized by the time, place and position of the reader, but one shaped by the history of social function and engagement built into the text through the object that the reader engages with, end quote. As songs, both Montero and Rumours are part of the genre of hip hop, encompassing both rap and pop. Their audiences are both broad and specific. Both Lizzo and Lil Nas X appeal to wide audiences through their appeals to popular music. But the imagery invoked in their respective videos highlights their more specific black audiences. Several scholars have noted the proliferation of music video engagement with the classical. Many of them focused around this same genre and with similar functions. However, not all of these treat the subject with such a reverence. For example, the Carter's video for Apeshit reconfigured the black subject as a serious consumer and creator of art through their utilisation of the Louvre. The Carters, it must be remembered and noted, are shaped by their own positions as members of a kind of pop royalty. And this is reflected in other works in which they celebrate blackness via classical illusion, including Beyonce's uh, visual album, Black is King. Here, uh, the Carters express their own positionality um, as, uh, a, as belonging to an almost upper class of celebrity in America. Um, and while, they are, while their video expresses inclusion along racial lines, there are cer there's certainly room to critique this inclusion along other lines, including class. In contrast, both Lizzo and Lil Nas X cultivate a visual language of black celebration that encompasses an inclusivity of black diversity. In this way, they both use irreverent references to classical intermediaries as a strategy for creating an inclusive product. Both videos were directed by Tanu Mwino, whose other works include uh, Normani featuring Cardi B's Wild Side video and Cardi B's Up video both of which also feature classical illusion. Wild Side features Zodiac references, while Up features an extended scene including Cardi lounging with dancers in a giant clamshell, reflecting the birth of Venus. Like Montero and Rumours, Up's references to antiquity are clearly mediated by popular images of its reference. Thus, as a director, Mino is able to work with her collaborating artists to create a visual language of irreverent classics that reassert these works as themselves worthy of praise and respect. 
both the album cover for Montero and the end scene of Rumours playfully reference classical paintings, both on the screen here. Michelangelo's creation of Adam from Montero and Jacques-Louis David's neoclassical painting, The Oath of the Horatii for Rumours. Again, underpinning this point about the use of intermediaries to refer to the ancient past. Also of note here is uh, André Lefebvre's work on translation and the politics of rewriting. Lefebvre asserts that canonical works and the classics are sometimes destabilized or later exalted, depending upon what he refers to as the dominant poetics. Some classics remain as such for very long periods of time, instead of being rewritten to bring them into line, uh, instead, instead of being rewritten to bring them into line with the dominant poetics of the day. What happens then when canonical works are revitalized through rewriting? via marginal poetics. Montero and Rumours engage in this very practice of rewriting. Both take the black audience seriously by destabilizing the whole tradition. Arguably, the disconnect that I identify is deliberate uh, and itself artificial, instilling an air of inclusivity and, uh, and accessibility for the audience through a claim not to have engaged with antiquity. Irreverence thus becomes a key strategy for receiving the classics as texts that belong to everybody and that do not entirely deserve their reputation as serious canonical texts. Irreverence here produces the effect of not having engaged with a certain text, for example, as Lil Nas X's video, or a deliberate ob obfuscation of a reading of a text, thus rendering it widely intelligible and inclusive which is the case of Lizzo's video. In Montero, to look more uh, closely, Lil Nas X's unapologetic queerness is expressed through the camp visuals that deliberately evoke other, also camp perceptions of Heracles. Nas's blackness is integral to his invocation of Heracles, adding as it does another dimension to the image of him in chains. Nas's blackness is, through popular, although racist ideas about black manhood and masculinity, allowed to stand in for his physical masculinity, one which is not the same as the bodybuilder Hercules that he references. And the image of him in chains evokes the spectre of slavery, as well as reminding us of Hercules' time in bondage to Omphile, the subject of the follow-up to the 1958 Hercules' 1959 Hercules Unchained. In the narrative of the video, Naz is in chains for acting upon his gay desire. And this undermines the idea of the hyper-masculine, hyper-sexualized black man that is such a common trope, particularly in North American and European media, and often used to play on fears about miscegenation and the, the dangers to white femininity. Lil Nas X is quite literally the only character in the video, rejecting both whiteness and femininity together, thus immediately rejecting the trope and his trial by judges of ambiguous gender, all played by himself, itself undermines the expected narrative of slavery and bondage the viewer might have expected upon seeing a black man in chains. This trope is further dismantled by his rejection of the Herculean ideal. Naz does not break out of the chains, but is hit in the head by a sex toy and dies, with the next scene showing an initial ascent to heaven. Although the scene is, on the surface, a close copy of a famous and enduring image of a modern Hercules, this version of the hero we think we know is entirely subverted as the whole idea that, is, that, is, that the hyper-masculine, straight, white hero will break his chains and rescue the damsel in distress. The Montero video carefully curates the image of Hercules in order to reject all of the normative categories, and the irreverent invocation of SpongeBob further rejects the traditional receptive history of the mythological hero. In this way, then, Lil Nas X disconnects his own version of Hercules from the traditional narrative by hitching it to the 1958 Peplum version, which itself creates a new node of receptive history. Similarly, uh, in rumors, Lizzo's costume and her appeals to the muses underpin her invocation of both a specifically black classicism, underpinned by her celebration of her black musical foremothers, including sister Rosetta Tharp, whose likeness is illustrated on one of the animated vases. 
The close association with Thalia pins the video to Distance Hercules as a vehicle for recognition, while renegotiating the classical theme to position black femininity on par with divinity. This is also carried out through, uh, through visual strategies, including Lizzo's body positivity um, and the image of the pregnant Cardi B as a caryatid. In conclusion then, uh, I hope that I've demonstrated some of the uh, the strategies for for illustrating the the requirement for a reference in some of these classics uh, in some of these um in some of these receptions and the ways in which irreverence can be a a good method for us considering some of the theoretical concerns around classical reception um, and in particular thinking about how disconnected receptions can still be justified as uh, as instances of classical reception thank you for listening